So won't you join me in welcoming Mark Acardipane. <laughs> so the first track I played when everyone was filtering in here was by PCP, and it was called We Are From Frankfurt. Uh, I think we should tell people a little bit about growing up in Frankfurt. It's going to recur a lot in this conversation and is a pretty important part of your identity. So tell me a little bit about the neighborhood that you grew up in and what kind of stuff you were up to when you were a teenager, let's say 15 or 16. I started really early with the music when I was eight, learning classic guitar. And when I was 12, also electronic guitar. And with 16, oops. just put the mic closer to your mouth. <laughs> well, um, I hang around in uh, bunkers because there you can play loud music. Was interested in football, and then with 16, I started also um, buying drum machines, synthesizers, and stuff. What was the impetus to start buying drum machines and synthesizers? Like, what? Who had you heard that had one that made you want one? Actually, my teacher for electronic guitar, he was playing in a really bad punk band, and he got the 808, he got the MS-20, an eight-track recorder, and I really liked that. But the major thing was because all my members from the band didn't want to go the way, live from the music or die. I want to do that, they don't. So, and then I thought, okay, with electronic music, I need nobody. And you also thought at that time, or shortly after, that electronic music was sort of the future of rock music in a way. Like rock music was kind of getting to be, I don't know, this old dinosaur, and electronic music was a place that you could put those same vibes. It's a generation thing, but this comes a little later. When I was 16, there was no techno. So the techno came, I don't know, 18, 19, 20, when I was like that. Of course, that is the new generation. Rock and roll was over. So, and I see techno as the rock and roll of today, definitely. So there was music that was hard and made with synthesizers and stuff, stuff like Belgian New Beat and EBM that you got onto at some point before techno, right? Yeah, I was in Mallorca. And there was a girl, and everybody thought she's my sister, and everybody, the other thought I'm her brother, but we never met, actually. And then we met, and she gave me Front 242 official version, which is a Belgian record. It's kind of electro body music, really nice sounds, electronic. I didn't like the groove. I was more into the Detroit techno stuff, which was more groovy, but I didn't like the sounds of Detroit. It was not hard enough for me. And so that was the idea, maybe, to mix something out of that. Because we were really in the hip hop scene in the beginning, but we mixed up break beats with techno sounds and rap and all the hip hop crews we play on battles. They thought we are totally mad because we not fit in there. And then one day you look in the mirror, you say, okay, I'm white and I'm not coming from Compton, so we need our own street music in Frankfurt. And that's how hardcore techno was born. So what were some of your favorite hip hop artists back in those days? NWA. I got no. all the records. I have also the world-class working crew with Dre. I got the first 12-inch, uh, the Dope Man from NWA. And of course, Public Enemy, first record I have. Run DMC. Yeah. yeah, we are based in Frankfurt. We had all the Americans there. So that's why there was a really strong hip-hop scene. I think we can hear echoes of that same vibe that's in those records that Definitely. you mentioned. Uh, later on when we hear your music. So what were the first clubs that you were going out to? I mean, there were some pretty famous clubs in Frankfurt, uh, a place called Dorian Gray, and then I guess a little later, a place called The Omen. Were those places that you would have been going or you were only in hip hop shows? No, in the beginning in the Dorian Gray, it was Friday. It was called the Techno Club, but they play more electro body music, which I don't like except from 242. And um, I don't know, later, the Omen came later, I think, 91, when the whole techno movement starts. Before Omen was also more a commercial club, 
but I didn't go to hip hop parties only when we played there. Too much trouble there. <laughs> I don't know. You you don't seem some a stranger to trouble. Ah, <laughs> uh, we'll get to that you later. Say that. <laughs> So this club Dorian Gray was kind of crazy because it was at the airport for one thing and it had a Richard Long sound system. So like a very famous guy built a sound system and I was watching some videos and it looked more like a little bit fancy and more like a discotheque but also quite developed for that time in the late 80s. Did you that's, like it there? That's true, yeah, yeah, of course. But I came more later, so like the usual Frankfurt Techno Weekend starts on a Friday in the Omen with Sven Fate. There you hang out until 12 o'clock in the morning. Then you try to stay awake until 6, 7 in the evening, then you go to bed. 4 o'clock you get picked up and then we go to the Dorian Gray because at 6 o'clock DJ Duck took over and then it goes until 12 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Then you hang out in the park when the weather is good, whatever, and in the evening we had this other club called XS, which was a chill-out club where you have some tea and then later you go home and this was the Frankfurt weekend. Sounds pretty tight. Yeah. <laughs> um, so did you get all the guys that were in your hip-hop crew with you? Did you like take them over with you to the techno side? We were already techno. I don't know how we be in this, I don't know, it was an accident. It was never planning that we play on hip-hop battles. Well, I don't know, we know a lot of hip-hop people from Frankfurt, of course. They hang out in our office. We also did a label, Dope on Plastic, with them together. I'm just wondering because... Yeah, there was no, no techno party, so the first year we play, I don't know if somebody knows here, Nine Inch Nails. KFMDM, it was Nine Inch Nails, American group. And we play support for them, like real concerts. So, and, but the real parties start in 91. And then all of a sudden we play there. Yeah. So I want to show um, video number one. Unfortunately, we didn't get the subtitles, but um, I think it will be fun to watch anyways. All right, so that's a video of yourself and your partner in Planet Core Productions, Torsten Lambert, from January 1990 on German TV. And I'm sorry we don't have the subtitles, but you're talking about how techno is the future. You're kind of over rock and roll because it's like ACDC, Led Zeppelin. It's not really possible to go further for you with that music. Um, and you said that punk was destructive but techno is telling us about the future, which I thought was a really interesting sentiment. The other interesting thing that happens in there, what, what club is that? Do you remember? So the music hall in Frankfurt, we went it to check some tracks. That's why nobody's there. <laughs> yeah, so you're playing to this club with no one in it, but what you said was that you rented out the club just so you could go play the tracks and hear yeah. them, and I guess see if they were gonna work to release. Exactly, yeah. white labels from DAT and stuff like that. So at this time, 1990, were you already DJing out in clubs? No, no this starts more than 91. We also not so much DJ in the beginning, we were more live act. In the beginning was uh, FBI, which was Free Base International, and then later PCP. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I was just, I guess I was wondering if um, when you finally made a record that you gave to a local DJ, like you're, you're going through this process where you're testing out your records and you're seeing like, okay, is this any good? Does this need a better kick? Is this strong enough to work in a club? I was wondering that and I was also wondering what people's reaction in Frankfurt was to maybe the first release on PCP? Yeah, the first release uh, was played by DJ Duck in the Dorian Gray, but a much funnier story is the PCP 006, which was We Have Arrived, the first distorted track ever, which is also on Wikipedia. When we played the first time live, the sound engineer ran to me, say, you destroy my PA, but he didn't know that the whole track was already distorted. Nobody heard that before. It was also in the music hall. It was the big rave from Sven was the first rave in Frankfurt where we played at. 
This is Sven Vaith that yeah, you're talking Sven about. You know him? <laughs> One of the biggest DJs in the world, still. So Sven Vaith was supportive of you guys yeah, when you started. Totally. His first interview on MTV, he had our member jacket on. And there was only, I think, 11 jackets with the PCP. It was the same that NWA had. <laughs> And he did his first interview on MTV with it, so he was with us in the crew, yeah. Um, how did you meet Sven Vaith for the first time or become friends with him? We were really wasted after a party, and I was in a restaurant, and he sits in front of me. It was 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was telling him, hey, you're a great DJ, but the music you produce with the other guys, because he's not a producer, it sucks. And I invite him to my studio, and two weeks later he came. And I think nobody ever say that to him before, because it's more like everybody lick his ass. <laughs> so he came to the studio. Did you guys make some stuff together? Yeah, a few tracks yeah, for my compilation Frankfurt Tracks, which was on CBS at that time. So this, uh, there was this series, Frankfurt Tracks, that you're mentioning. Um, which were these very dense compilations, 10 tunes, 12 tunes, um, that were really pushing the sound that you were developing. But one of the notable things about these compilations is that a lot of the tracks were produced by you guys under different names. Exactly. Nearly every track on this compilation was produced by me, yeah. <laughs> Later, when we had some artists, there was a few. I mean, we always tried to that people really believe that all these artists exist. In my head, they exist. So we had this little program on the Atari where you can make phantom pictures. So that's how we create our artists. And then there was things happened, like one magazine doesn't believe. And then uh, there was a guy in Italy. He picked us up from the airport. And I was look at him, and I say to Torsten, my partner, do we know him? And he looked exactly like Ace of Space, was the track we hear later. So we put him a beard on, give him the record, make a picture, and send it to the press. Can we actually show <laughs> photo number six? Ah. <laughs> okay, so. So that's Ace there on the right. Up. Bottom, bottom right. That's Nasty that's Ace Django. The, Ace the Space. His little paper Castro, and this is his father. It's T-Bone Castro. They're from Cuba. <laughs> and this is Marshall Masters. We had this name long before Eminem from 90s. But really funny is you can't do good girls with this program. So that's why we didn't have any female artists. And so when you see T-Bone's nose is a dick. <laughs> really. <laughs> OK, so this program, <laughs> that's good. That's fu it was funny. I like it. Uh, this program was actually something people were using to make mug shots, right? Like criminal I guess criminal so. I think so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And I think that you told me that you made nearly all of these characters almost in one night. Mm -hmm. Like you were having a wild night with... It's called The Night Where It Was Bright. Why is it called <laughs> that? I don't think I tell this here. <laughs> Okay, so you can ask Mark later what happened, but you and Torsten, your partner in PCP, stayed up all night long mm -hmm. on this computer. Exactly. Yeah. Making all these different characters. On the old Atari ST. And they all have different personalities for you, right? Yep. So can you just talk a little bit more about um, what kind of tunes those different people we saw make? It came after a while. First, you like you produce the track, and then we sit down. Okay, what fits? But then after a while, it's like T-Bone Castro, for example. His 909, the closed hi hat is broke, so all the tracks is with the open hi hat. <laughs> Nasty Django it was more like uh, the the dirty young style, you know. But it was not like I sit down and do it. But for me, it was freedom, because like I don't know, I do also the mover. The mover is really kind of depressive, dark. But I'm not every day like that. One day I'm happy, one day I'm not happy, and so that's all the characters come off. And Marshall Masters is more like ravey, party. Ace of Space is a gangster. That's why his first track, Nine, is a classic. 
We get also these nice shirts with Ace of Space, what's the root boy number with a nine millimeter on the back. It was a great seller. <laughs> Maybe we should actually hear yeah, play nine, nine millimeter so you can hear what it sounds like. So this is actually the first record I ever bought. It's a big record in Los Angeles where I'm from. Uh, this is by Ace the Space, Nine is a Classic. Hell yeah. So this may be obvious to some people, but what is that noise that we're hearing in the beginning of that tune? You mean the synth? Yeah. That's the famous Mantasm Hoover sound coming from the MKS-50 or Juno 2, Roland. So kind of made popular by Joey Beltram. Exactly. Mentasm. Joey was the first one with Mantasm. When I heard the track, I thought, he's an alien. Where he get that sound from? This is maybe a thing that you guys don't have anymore today. There's coming sounds. You heard them somewhere all the time. But with us, we heard sounds that you never heard before in the beginning. So I remember when I heard Mantasm in the club, it was like unbelievable when it hits in. And then there was a second track was The Dominator from Human Resource, and then we came with the street version, Nine is a Classic. And uh, something else is happening in this record with the sample, which is from a pretty famous hip hop record yeah. by the 45 King. You can hear a little <laughs> bit of that. You really worked that record for Ace the Space. <laughs> and the funny thing, I don't know if there's a track with the beat, because I only know the a cappella. We had only the record with the a cappella, but I never heard the track to it, or is there is there a track? Yeah, there is a track. Yeah, I yeah. never heard that one. Um, so, I mean, back then, you were, obviously, there were a lot of hip-hop records that came with acapellas, so sampling Every them. record on the B-side was always the acapella. Yeah, it's so different now. The hip-hop artists kind of gathered that they don't want their sam stuff sampled anymore. But back then, you must... Nobody cares. Even Chuck D, I remember he was saying in an interview, everybody can sample our stuff because hip hop is based on samples, so why they should complain if somebody else sample it. I never had any trouble, and I sample a lot. Well, you're one of the lucky <laughs> ones then. <laughs> so, I mean, what did you have in your studio back in 1989? Like, what were all these early PCP tracks made on? In the beginning, it was only the Emacs emulator sampler with a half megabyte of sampling time. That's a lot. And a 909, that's it. And a cheap Roland mixer. And two effects. But they were not mine, so it was not my 909, not my mixer, not my effects, but the sampler was mine. Who did these other things belong to? The 909? I don't remember. The other one was from a guy from a metal band. He was a drummer in a metal band, and he quit with them, and he had a studio, and he had no use for it, so he put it in my apartment. I ask because we were talking before about how a lot of your tracks have become these huge hits, and they're so effective, and people still love them to this day and sing along to them, and they're still considered such classics, but actually there's very few elements Mm -hmm. in most of them. That's true. Less is more. <laughs> yeah, because she told me yesterday that a lot of you ask for mixing, and we talked about that yesterday, so 80% of a good mix is the selection of the sounds. If you have too much, the biggest mix in the world can do nothing with it. I worked with Jimmy Douglas, you know this guy? Huh? From, he's mixed Timberland, Justin Timberlake. Missy Elliott and all that stuff, he got 500 platinum records. He mixed once three tracks of mine, and they sound worse than my demos. It cost me a lot, but I learned a lot, because I did wrong with the sounds. And then I fix it, and then it sounds good. And when I listen today to my old songs and why they sound good, we didn't thought about that, or I didn't thought about that in the past. You had not so much uh, options, so if the sound doesn't fit, you look for a new one, until it fits, and then it fits. And that's the most important. So what you're saying is rather than slapping an EQ on something and exactly. being like, this doesn't fit, let me try to take out this frequency or let me move this around, you didn't have that option. So you were just like, boom, 
Let me just make a exactly. new sound. Exactly. Uh, like the first mixer, you got treble, bass, and that's it. So, okay, you also have to say that the analog synths have a much nicer curve than plugins. Of course, yeah. so when you look like a MOOC and you look at an analyzer without EQing, he got a nice low end, not too much, and not a lot of shit from the plugins. They have a lot of low shit, a lot of high frequencies you have to turn out. But a lot of people do too much. You know, they put on the sound 10 plugins, and maybe you also experience in the end, you put all 10 off and it sounds better than before. So you need a good basement, shit in, shit out. So, and also like we fix it in the mix, oh yeah, it's not mastered. I hear this so much when people play me tracks, it's not mastered. When it doesn't sound good unmastered, it also will not sound great when it's mastered. Um, we were also talking about how, of course, you ended up trying out these different mixers, some of, and mastering people, some of whom were quite famous and worked on big pop records, Major Laser, and all this. But in the beginning, all these tracks that we're going to hear for the next while, you were doing everything yourself. And I think that there's a lot of your style, the PCP style, that has to do with the way that you chose to mix the songs or the sounds that you chose to use. Like, you weren't necessarily you jumping all over the place. You had sounds that you liked. You had a mixing style that you liked that was different than a lot of the records that were coming out at that time. Exactly, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what was on your mind back then? I mean, granted, you didn't know as much as you know now, probably, but... Yeah, when I remember today, I had a lot of compressors, but from the few from today, I had no idea how they work. <laughs> and um, always tried to have different things that the other have, which means everybody got a Mackie board, so I don't have a Mackie board. Because it's also part of your sound, so the most thing for me important is preamps. Just distortion, saturation, third harmonic. That's, that's your sound, you know? Even if you take a plug-in synthesizer and put it to a nice preamp, it will sound 10 times better than before. Even if you have them both there, you don't hear much of a difference, but as soon as the kick comes in, everything with the preamp stands in front. Oh, and, and so my mixer is my sound. I got it back three months ago. <laughs> because I was also on the digital way then, but it's good. So now I have both, but I can't live without the analog. So a lot of your sound in those days was coming from the limited pieces of gear that you had, but also the way that you used those pieces. So you didn't, you didn't want to have, like, Nobody wanted to have the same sound as, even if everybody had a 909, everybody was trying to work in the 909 to not. Yeah, that's your drums, and it's so easy. On the mixer was one to eight is your drums, and it's always your drums. Your snare is your 909. Maybe you have an 808, patch it. Nowadays, there's too much options. Everybody from us have folders with millions of snare samples. Do you want to sit there? You know, better create your own, you know, and there's a guy. He's pretty young, we talk a lot together, and he was saying one good thing after I introduced him to the old school production. He was saying, man, back in the days you all had the same stuff, but you all sound different. Now, there's so many options and they all sound the same. Which is a big problem, I see. Well, in a minute I want to talk more about the ethos too, because I think that was part of it, as everybody had a very strong, uh, kind of feeling about what their style was, what their ethics were, what their commitment was to the music that they were making and what they were trying to say. But before we do that, we have an MPC here, and I think that you can actually illustrate this point about what your tunes are composed of, or at least the early stuff. Yeah, I play my whole life with the MPC. I start with the 3000, the same that Dr. Dre has. My hero. No. <laughs> and, and always when I play live, and I have here the 16 pads, I see the simplicity of my songs. This is one of the biggest hits in hardcore history. It got a kick. It's from the 909. It got a tom. It got a crash. A vocal sample. And a melody. And all together it sounds like this. And 
that song. <laughs> because... <laughs> Because our brain, I don't know if ever somebody told you, can only fix four elements at the same time, which is the resin section, normally two instruments, and the singing. Okay, we don't have singing here. Everything more is confusing. And a lot of people do too much. You know, it's the same like, oh, layer this sin ten times. Why? Look for a good one. You know? Also, back in the days, you don't have 20 reverbs. You had maybe two and a delay. So you take one sound and everything sounds like completely with a nice room. Today it's too much and then it sounds like shit. Do you have another song on there you want to play I have a lot here. What do you want to hear? Okay, that one was Stereo Murder that we just heard. Right? Mm, There's one one. Oh, you want to hear another one with a... Hip hop sample. Walk in, I stumble to the phone and conjure up a bitch to bone when I'm alone. Oh shit, you pull back and need to take a piss. Only when I'm drunk, I sing a song like, Ain't no fun in my gas. That's it, and the vocal. Also, one of the hits are still in the Netherlands, played since, I don't know, 25 years on every hardcore party. And then the whole audience sing it, ain't no party like an alcoholic party. You have the a cappella? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the alcoholics. I don't know if you know, from New York. Hip-hop group. I even put them in the publishing, so also never get stressed. I don't know if they ever heard the track, but at least we try to get some money. So what was people's reaction in the beginning when you were making this music that had all these hip-hop samples and it was super fast and super tough? Because I understand you said it to me a couple times that people sort of considered you the gangsters or the hooligans <laughs> of techno. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, tell me more about it. Did you, was yeah, so hardcore was really negative for the people. So we always get disses. In the beginning, they like it, but then not so much anymore. I don't know, because everybody try to get his style, for, or like the labels they had to put down to the people. Even the people don't want to hear that. Because in my experience, also today, the young generation always want to have energy music, they want to have hard music, they want rave, they don't want, yeah, I don't know, boring music. And there was 94, 95, a lot of boring music, and so everybody tried to diss us, or I don't know, or don't book us. So that's how I came to Holland. I think it was 96, yeah. So everybody split up in, in Germany with the sounds. So before it was all techno, and one was harder, one was softer. But then came all these styles, and this was you know, the beginning of the end, I would say. We'll, we'll get a little bit more to your career in Holland for a minute, because your music ended up becoming so big there, being affiliated with a culture called Gabber. But uh, back, so PCP starts in 1989. Actually, we need to talk about We Have Arrived, uh, Mescalinium United which is one of your first big tunes, and is the reason your music starts getting to New York City, where you find sort of these people that are kind of kindred spirits in a way. People like Lenny D, Frankie Bones, Adam X, also hip hop guys who have become ravers, techno guys. Yeah, I met Lenny from New York on the Wasted Party, I told you guys before, where I talked to Sven Fate the first time. It was raining outside, we all leave the club, nobody was there anymore, and they're sitting these two guys, one was Lenny D from New York, the other guy was from Enjoy, from London, who mixed later the Prodigy, Firestarter. He was a techno artist at that point. And then we go to the car and I thought, hey, wasn't that the guys who play in the other club? And Torsten said, yeah, I think so. 
What they're doing here in the rain? So we go there, and nobody told them which hotel they are in. So they sit there, and then we take them home. And Lenny saw the studio, and he said, "Can you play some?" And I play, and we have arrived. And he listened to this track. I don't know, six hours, really. And then he gave me money and said, "Man, I want to release that in America." And this became then the first record of his label, Industrial Strengths, and re-released it also in Germany. So it was a sub-license for him. Shall and for us it was really good, because in Germany it's always like that. If somebody from America play it, it's much cooler than if we play it. So, you know, typical Germany. In Holland it's different. To become uh, known or respected in Holland, you take a few years. I had a hit of the year in Holland, 96, and I was not even invited to get my Grammy. Or well, not Grammy, they call it different, I don't know. I saw it in a magazine a year later. They sent it then to me. Now they love me, but uh, so this is a big difference. But in Germany, it's always like, oh, yeah, yeah. So that's why it was a good uh, thing that Lenny came to Germany and play our music. I remember on the May Day, he played all our white labels, and all the German teachers, oh, what is that? <laughs> I say, you have them. They all had them, but they never listened to them. This was the problem. So Lenny helped us a lot at that point. And I guess you, your music had a huge influence on those guys. I mean, Frankie Bones said that you kind of made the perfect music for playing in warehouse parties in New York, and he felt like your music, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically was like the music of the apocalypse. <laughs> like he heard it, he, he felt that it was very like dystopian and he loved that about it. And I guess that fit New York in those times because New York was still quite like destroyed and there were empty warehouses around. I played there only once, 96, on Lenny's party, which the police interrupt us and close the party down. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> as big of a hip hop fan as you were, you didn't actually go, you didn't actually go to New York until later. No. So what else can you tell me about this Mescalinium United track, We Have Arrived? Why has it called We Have Arrived? I think I had the feeling, or we had the feeling at that time, that this is the sound we're going for. Before it was a lot of testing and it was all good records, but We Have Arrived was like, when I did it, I know, that's it. From that point we go. So this was kind of your opening statement yep. to everybody. Watch out. And it was released on a white record, without name, without nothing. Do this today. It's not so easy. <laughs> but that helps create the mystique around it. Yeah. Um, all right, let's hear it. This is Mescalinium United with We Have Arrived. And like the distorted sound was also like an accident because back in the days when you had like a cheap mixer had not much headroom so you always come to this point where everything was distorted but it sounds shit so you go down, do it again, do it again. But at that point I thought, wow, I leave it like that. And you hear also the, the reverse cut is all done with tape. Real cut it. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Tape? Yeah, two track tape. And then but what did you actually cut, do? Turn it around and then it's reversed. Or you also do the arrangements. But before you record, you have to, yeah, that you don't have a problem later with the, rever uh, with the reverbs. So, because I just heard that track before we edited it. And it's really funny because at the drop, it stops and then the reverb sounds off and then the kick comes back in. And so this was the editing points that it gets that impact when the whole thing comes back. Did you use a lot of tape edits in those days? Yes, for all the reverse cuts. I like that, I heard it from Detroit, and so we also get a machine. Um, who were some people that were making music around this time that you also liked besides hip hop people? Like who were some people within the electronic music realm that you thought were? Underground Resistance from Detroit, Richie Horton, Canada. Detroit. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Windsor, Ontario. Joey Canada. Beltram, of course. Uh, Cisco, the Advent Affix Twin. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, uh, you met, I guess, Aphex Twin around this time because he ends up remixing this record of yours. Yes. Maybe a year later or something. I was with, uh, with the guy when we bought the DAT machine for Richard, Aphex Twin, in Belgium and sent it to him. And then this label, Arnes, asked me which, who I would like to remix this track. I say, okay, uh, Richard. So, but we met after in England when we played together. So, but his re he did two remixes. He normally only do one, but he liked it so much. And he also he say in the magazine um, the B side of We Have Arrived is the best track ever made. And when Richard say this, this is like wow, you know, because Richard was God in Germany. The move or not. And in England it was the other way around because when I played the first time in London, I was that big on the flyer and he like that. And I said, what? So he got the same problem like me. When you come from Germany, nobody cares. He comes from London, nobody cares. But in the rest of the world, Afex Twin was like huge. I mean, until today. Yeah, if you listen to his early tracks, you can definitely hear the influence of the hardcore sound, for sure. Um, maybe we should listen to a little bit of the B-side of We Have Arrived. Ah, you get it. Which is called Reflections of 2017. So already back in 1990, 1991, you were thinking about the year 2017. There's also a funny story. <laughs> okay, let's hear it first and then we'll hear the funny Because the story. track is normally completely different. It's uh, with the Oberheim, with a keyboard. And then something happens. I don't know, he got a hanging in the sound. And I leave it and record it to the end and did some reverse cuts and that's it. But normally the synth plays something totally different. So you can never make that. And that's what I also like in the analog. You never know what happens. You know, you're on the wrong MIDI channel or something, I don't know. And you will hear it's a really weird sound. But that's Richard's famous. Okay, will you point out when the weird sound happens? Just point at it. So and here you hear like how to try to be different. I mean, take any synth and try to copy that sound. It's not so easy. Yeah, I guess you had the help of the synths sometimes doing what they wanted as well, right? Yes. Late at night in the studio, what's going on? Or the apocalypse never. I don't have that one. Hmm? There's also, I don't know, there's a track that Nina play, Nina Kravitz play in a moment and it was also a really stupid story. I was sitting like that in the studio, and I had the keyboard was like here. It's downstairs, here was the computer, and I had the sound also in the Oberheim, same synth like that. And I had no idea, and I was sitting like this, was a little bit tired, and then I fall from the table over the keyboard, like, boom, and I said, wow, that sounds cool. And then I played the whole track with the elbow, and that's really true. And that's the track that Nina plays now since a couple of months, always at the closing track. <laughs> Wild man. So that song that we heard, Reflections of 2017, is under your The Mover alias. Yes. And The Mover was actually your nickname yeah. in Frankfurt. Why were you called that? Because I move things. I born in April and things that, oh, you have some English. Uh, you have people say, ah, oh, you cannot, you cannot do that. I can. When I went 96 to Holland, I said, okay, I go there and be the number one. And everybody was like, <laughs> one year later I was. Or like 92, I said, oh, in one year, techno parties will be in big halls in Germany, Frankfurt Festhalle, Dortmund Westfalenhalle. And the journalist like, <laughs> never. One year later it was. So you always have to believe in things. If they happen or not, you know, there's also things that doesn't happen. But if you put like uh, before, oh, no, this will never happen, it will never happen. And this is with all things in life, not in music. You know, if you say, yeah, I want to become a big star, you say, oh, no, I never make it. You will never make it. You know, believe in yourself. So going back to the 2017 part and the mover, the mover is, for me anyway, your darker and trippier alias, a little bit different than the guy who's like, let's all get drunk and... Whatever, like it seems more introspective and it seems more it's me, yeah. dark. Um, it's the most me. Tell me a little bit about what this idea of 2017 you had was back in those days. Or why this number? Why this year? 
Over about two years, I had dreams and episodes, five times a week, and it was all happened in 2017. So it had nothing to do with the music, actually, or that I was planning something. It had to be to do with the world, with the future. But we're still here. <laughs> so what were the dreams specifically? You, were they something apocalyptic or dark about the year 2017? I don't want to tell. Okay. But you were putting that idea into this music of what you were seeing in your mind. Yeah. Interesting. Um, all right, fair enough. We can just listen to the record. I, I never and see told what you nobody. Were I think there's only two people I told in my whole life. That's Torsten, my partner, and Sean, my long music partner also. So when, after you started putting out this music, like what were the first big, huge raves that you were playing as PCP? I think the really first big was Hellraiser. What year would Mayday? that have been? I don't know. Mayday or Hellraiser? I don't know. What, mm. year, what year was it in? 93. I think it was both in 93, but I don't know which comes further, uh, first. Hellraiser is in Holland, in Amsterdam. Big, huge hall. Really famous. Yeah, and Mayday. Uh, what, what was it? In Dortmund, yeah. Where we had the fight. <laughs> yeah. That's why you asked me, huh? Huh? No, I was <laughs> just wondering if you, um, when you realized that this music that you were making was getting really big, and I think the experience of going to play um, you know, like maybe you're playing around Frankfurt or something, but this experience of going to a rave and being like, oh, there's thousands of people who love my music. Is I a think huge it was thing. in Holland. Because Holland had so many raves. They put like, I don't know, 10 posters in the city, and in the evening there was 10,000 people. And in Germany, we only had the May Day once a year, and there was like 10, 12,000 with a big campaign. And Holland is a lot smaller than Germany. I think it was in Holland, yeah. But you're right that I do want to show the video of May Day. Oh. <laughs> um, so we're going to play a video of May Day, which is a pretty legendary early rave here in Germany. It happened in Dortmund, but was actually put on by the Low Spirit crew, which who are from Berlin, who are sort of headed up by West Bam, like one of the first big DJs of this scene and his brother. Um, and there's kind of a rivalry between German cities, right? Or there was back in those days. Was there already a rivalry when you went to play the rave? Of course. So and, and after, you know, there was low spirit and they had a lot of commercial acts. So West Bam, he was okay. We had no problem with him, but they had also like Marusha, Mark O was really commercial, they were in the charts. So they always want to have their artist shining. And on this rave also Moby play, and also Lenny D. And they cut up Moby sound. Prodigy was also there, I think. Yeah, Prodigy was also there, but it was before they became big, or real big. <laughs> and um, yeah, they tried to do the same with us, but then uh, they started a fight on stage because we were planned for 15 minutes, we asked for 20 and they cut at a minute 11 when we play Nine is a Classic, which was 93 hit of the year in Germany because they don't want that we are shine there. So, and Moby destroy his keyboard, I will not destroy my keyboard. And uh, with Lenny, they put out all the high frequencies during he DJ. With Jeff Mills, they were all cool because he was with them, but Lenny not and the party called The Judgment Day, in, in real, yeah. <laughs> yeah was, and then we did the track, was called Low Spirit Suck My Cock, which was on uh, Sunder Dome and sold 180,000 copies. And since this day, Low Spirit hate us, of course. And that's how we became big in Holland also, because they, just, they tried that we not play anymore in Germany, and they had big influences. And then we became big in Holland, where the Sunder Dome came from. You guys were, um, were pretty good at doing hardcore diss tracks. Yeah. 
there back comes the <laughs> hip hop thing. You also didn't you do a diss track against the these guys that did this rave hit called Who is Elvis? Oh yeah. Okay, so there's a song called Who is Elvis and it sort of rips off this song by LA Style. No, no, in the, a way. The, no, it was like there was AMV which was the first uh, German techno distributor and I work there every Thursday, not for money. I go to the shops and check that all the techno records are in the right position. And my partner, my ex-partner Thorsten, he also worked there a little bit. So, And then we had this record called Who is Elvis, which became a chart hit. So was good for the distribution. And the distribution owner, his name is Alex Azari. And then the guy who did the track gave it to another label because there was at that time more handshake deals. And so we were really pissed off, so we did the record called Friends of Alex, and instead of Who is Elvis, we say Fick dich doch mal, which means like, fuck you. And we were selling, selling I don't know, 35,000 copies. We were three times on the position to hit the charts, but they didn't let us in because of the word fuck. At that time, it was not cool to use that. Nowadays, it doesn't matter anymore. And uh, now it's a legendary track. It's really funny. Because we didn't do the sample, it was, uh, I record a rapper, and he had to do it over and over again, and after I say, now you do it the ten times, he say, hey, fick dich doch mal, and I cut it from there. <laughs> but having an MC uh, with you as a live act was a really important part of your show, I think, as PCP, and even later on. At PCP, we had two. And then later on with the Ultimate MC from Trinidad. Yeah, I met him in Trinidad. Who were the, um, who were the MCs in PCP? Thorsten, my ex-partner, and Pan. They were from the early beginning. But it's also like an act. It's not only MC. I don't would call them real MCs. It's psychos. <laughs> Some psychos. <laughs> okay, well, let's play video number two. This is PCP live at Mayday from April 30th, 1993. Um, we can actually play video number three, too. So that's earlier on. You guys only played for 15 minutes, 17 uh, minutes? I think nine or 11, I don't know. Um, but you can see in this video number three, you can see you guys kind of the getting trouble. told to stop, and then it starts. So what happened there? They just cut you off and just went into yeah, somebody else's? Yeah, we have else's. two other videos from the other side, from GTO. I don't know if you know guys, it was from England. And you see that Rutger Williams is the boss of, or he was the boss of Love Spirit. And he came to the engineer and said, and then he ran away. So there was like, uh, how do you say this in English? Uh, there's not the stairs, it's like that. With this. A ladder? Yeah, yeah exactly. So he was away and then the guy cut off and then we throw the guy from the stage, it was really high. And then the security wanted to get us and then uh, my fighting teacher was met on stage, he was in, in front of me and he had some chacos and Lenny's friend took the chacos and put it on the lighter so the security cannot come up. And on the other side, the other DJ starts already but nobody cares. So everybody stay in front like PCP. Well. That's like the opposite of uh, peace, love, unity, and respect, huh? They didn't respect us. Yeah, it was a different time then. I mean, there was a lot of, especially with the hardcore scene, you guys were up against a lot of people, I think because this kind of music was often dissed by people as too hard, too fast, too crazy. Right? Am I wrong? Yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that you guys already came with this attitude, but did, it, did you always feel like you were having to fight against someone to get the respect that you deserved? No, 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 definitely not. I'm a virgin. I'm a really nice guy. But like that, if you want to fuck with us, you know, then... I mean, this was disrespect when we have 15 minutes and they cut us at 11 with, when we played the hit of the year in Germany. It was not that we were over the time. You know, this was on purpose what they did. And this I don't like, you know, it must be always fair. 
So is there, um, at this time, was there something like, this is what f guys from Frankfurt are like and this is what guys from Berlin are like? Did people have a different image in the scene? No, not really. I mean, there was like Tarnit, for example. We didn't have any problem with Tarnit or some other guys. from. But it was also way back, there was always a problem also with the hip hop between Berlin and Frankfurt. So I don't know why it comes from. With Los Spiritus was only because they were commercial and we don't like that. And they had this all, all starting with the fake, you know, Marusha, she was everywhere and she not really can sing and she try. And somebody else was singing the record, so it was fake. We don't like that because you have to be real in the music. And I think maybe, you know, like also the track you play first from the video, it's called Konsta Blavache, which is a drug seller place in Frankfurt. And when you go there and the people say, psst, psst, how much you need? So we took that and make how fast you need. And that's why he was German when he asked how much you want and the people stream, I don't know, 800. Okay, I give you 800 BPMs. <laughs> and so normal people maybe, I don't know, it's too hard for them. We sound, I found it funny. Sven played it in the radio and on the next day it comes from every car in Frankfurt when you go outside. Because everybody knows pss, pss, how much you need. Yeah, you guys were amazing at figuring out how to make a hook, whether yeah. it was... And this track is didn't in, done in 20 minutes because there was a journalist there and he say, how long you need for a track? I said, 20 minutes? And then I did this track. And then I cleaned the studio and then I heard that Sven is in the radio. So I drove there and said, come on, play it. And then he fall from the table. He laughed so much. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing. So there's all these samples that people can grab onto and like identify the tracks. Even if they're not DJs, they can know, oh, yeah. this is the track where it says nine millimeters. This is a track where it does this. But also writing these very simple lines that people can actually sing along to, I think was a real strength of all of this music that you did in the 90s. I think it's a talent, yeah. <laughs> Um, I actually have video number four, just to illustrate this point. This is from Rome in 2005, but it's people singing along to, uh, to your track, like sort of a cappella. Amazing party. <laughs> so because the, the, uh, the organizer saw there's coming three to 500, he had two security guys. And then 5,000 people show up. It was Lori D and me. It was a, a big stadium for horses. And this was in the hall of the place. We were all happy that nothing happens because the promoter was really in fear that if there's some fights or whatever. But everything was peaceful. Like me. <laughs> so peaceful. <laughs> um, Lori D, of course, being a hardcore techno legend from Italy, from Rome. Um, yeah, I mean, there's more high-budget, beautiful photos I could show from later, from these, you know, like Thunderdome later on and these bigger raves. But I kind of like these old ones because it gives me the feeling of what it is actually like to be there with your head shaking around because it's so loud. <laughs> anyway, what song are they singing in that video? Uh, that's Into Wasteland by The Mover, which was in Rome the first techno track ever became big. Lori D was like what Sven Fade was for Frankfurt or West Bend for Berlin, Lori D is for Rome. And this is the track where everything started. And I didn't know that when I played the first time there, I was like, do they sing the song? And I put the fader down and I hear that they sing it. Is this one of your favorite songs that you've made as the mover? Mm, one of the three, yeah, definitely. I really love that song. It's got nice atmosphere, nice emotion. Okay, let's hear a little bit of it in its actual original state now that you've heard it sung a cappella. So that was Into the Wasteland by The Mover. What were you using to make that? I think also two Oberheim synths, the 909, and that's it. An 808. But I think it was a sample, the snare is 808. But it's also really simple. 
And it's funny on this track because, in a way, it's kind of commercial, but it's not. But it's, uh, you know what I mean? If you put like the drums away, put a guitar in and let the guy from Coldplay sing over it, can be a Radiohead, you know? Well. How much did you think about that at a certain point? Because um, by 93, 94, you're playing everywhere in these giant raves. People are playing your songs on the radio. Like, depending on what country you're from, hardcore is a very underground or niche music, but actually in Germany, Holland, Belgium, and maybe Italy, it's like giant. It became giant. Yeah. So were you thinking at some point about how much these tracks were going to sell? No, never. I mean, we had some, some things on our label. If we sell under 3,000, we stop the label. <laughs> but we never had to do it. At that time, the sales were really good. But we had also labels where we, for in front, we only press 500 to keep them cool. But we never thought about sales. You, at that time, you also you made enough money for everything. We also we didn't have to play or DJ or live. You could live from the sales. Nowadays, no. I think that you guys did some cool stuff in the marketing, though, of having these different aliases and having different. You had different labels at one point, so people. It, rather than putting everything under your own name, you had a lot of different things that people could buy into that seemed like they were buying all different people or all different things. Yeah. yeah, I think at that time it was great. Nowadays, it would be really difficult to do that. Or you want to have 80 Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts, I think you go mad. Because the focus is not there today. Uh, like back in the days, like you produce a record, you press it, you do some white labels, you send it to the shop, you give it to some DJs, they play it, they get a good reaction, you sell it to the shop, the people come to the shop, they order with you. Then you have a hit record. But nowadays you don't have that anymore. For example, you go to a techno club and you say, oh wow, I, know, I like the music, then you go on Beatport, put techno in, and then, uh, one million releases this week. There's more labels than artists on Beatport. It's really true. And, and so it is confusing. And then back in the days, you go to your favorite record store and you say like, ah, oh, that guy played last Friday there. I like his sound. What kind of music he play? And then the, he select you 100 records and then you find something. But nowadays to find a record is really hard. And that's a big difference to the past. There was also not so much. It's too much today. It's on the one way it's good that everybody with a low budget can make music, but there's also a lot of fakers because sometimes it's not bad that you work your ass up for one year to buy some equipment to do music, then you really know you want to do it. Because you know? nowadays with the crack software, everybody's doing music and release any shit with maybe loops. It was really funny, one year ago, a friend called me and said, hey, check out the Beatport Top 10, and there was seven tracks with the same shaker loop. Back in the days, we didn't have loops. We had no presets, nothing. You maybe find out, okay, that sound comes from that sin, but you still have to do it. And that sometimes is good for the music. Yeah, there was no tutorial on how to make the Hoover back yeah? in those times. No, no, no. <laughs> there was no Facebook, no YouTube, no nothing. So, I mean... I wish we had. <laughs> you do? Sometimes, yeah. Why? Yeah, because to get, for example, from Germany to America, 92, forget it. Today, it's easy. In, in three months, you can be a world star. If everything works right on the point and you're a little bit lucky, and everything works good. It was not possible back in the days. You know, you have to find a label. I saw now, I don't know, a couple of years ago on YouTube, there's one track of me called Cyborg Unknown, the year 2001, which was played in Detroit on a dance show. You guys watched that video? No. no. And, uh, but I didn't know at that time that they played it there. I didn't know it was big there. I know now from YouTube. Somebody recorded and put it on YouTube. Are you saying the Detroit New Dance show? Yeah, it's so funny. They didn't play the track there. Uh, but we didn't know. What song was it? 91, 92. It's the first dance ecstasy. All right, well, we'll look that up later. Uh. <laughs> I didn't get to that one. Um, so you mentioned Thunderdome. 
uh, which I think was kind of important in developing the aesthetics around hardcore. I mean, you guys already had stuff going on. There were people also in the Netherlands making this music and other places, but it really becomes that hardcore starts to have an aesthetic and a, a vibe. Tell me for, for you what Thunderdome was and this, this was also kind of the start of these big raves that we have now, like Mystery Land and Tomorrowland and all this stuff. That's true, but for me, the CD was bigger from notice than the parties, because I just, last year, the Thunderdome guys asked me because they put out a book soon, or it's out, I don't know, and they asked me the same question. For me, it was the CD, because when Thunderdome 3 came on the TV in Germany, the advertisement, it was like, everything changed, with this dog, with the pit bull, and then I that was the one it, so where they gonna... sell 180,000 copies. So it hits in the charts in Germany, and from that day, everybody, oh, what is this? Hardcore, cool. Then was the parties, but I think we didn't play so much on the first Thunderdomes. Later on, when they were really big, like 97, 98, there I play. But before, oh, I don't know, or maybe I don't remember, but I don't think so. So they were advertising the yeah. compilation CD of Thunderdome, which they is They had a nice advertisement with this Pitbull dog. <laughs> that was their logo. And so you were having, you had tracks on these Thunderdome compilations yeah, and therefore... Four, I think, four. Yeah. They were selling a lot. Yeah. There was the low spirit suck my cock on. The other three, I don't remember which one. <laughs> I'm just interested in it because I feel like the Netherlands took this music and really were able to market it um, to a worldwide audience eventually and also give it a sort of, like really tie it in with kind of like horror movie aesthetics or end of the world aesthetics. Like if you look at the names of the Thunderdome compilations, they are uh, Fuck Mellow, This Is Hardcore From Hell, The Fifth Nightmare, Caught in the web of death. It was not us. So the Holland people really like the horror. We warm, I like aliens. You like what? Aliens. I don't like horror movies at all. So, But in Holland it was so big. Like you go there and you sit in the hotel and you see a commercial advertising of uh, insurance. The kid is a gabber, which means it's a hardcore fan. Because otherwise you will not sell your insurance and I, w I have like school books where is my picture on front of it and it was so weird for us because in Germany hardcore was completely underground everybody hates it and in Holland was like pop music you know and if I come from the hotel and go in the taxi hey Mark where are you going because I was with IDNT then this is the guys the label from Sunderdome and they put me on TV for one week 45 minutes every night they put the same live show so everybody knows me there and so, again, Gabber is like, they have a bold hat, a $3,000 uh, training suit. And Gabber comes from, what is he, British? It's another language, it's a Judas uh, language, and it's called Friend. So it's, uh, it's like punk or the mods or whatever, and they call it the Gabber. So it's not a music style. A lot of people think it's a music style, but it's not. So in the beginning, the hardcore was called House in Holland. And then the Gabbers listened to the house, so it called Gabber House. We bring the name Hardcore to Holland. And then, and then they call it the Hardcore, but the subculture around it was called the Gab yeah. Gabber. Yeah, the Gabbers listened to it. It's the same like, I don't know if you know the group The Who. It's a big English rock band. And they were listened by the mods. And the mods, they wear like long suits driving the Vespa. And they have also really short hair, but the mods, uh, the, the who's were not the mods, so it was like the punk. So, but there's a lot of confusion, but if you go to a, a, a Dutch guy and say like, Gabber music, he would look at you like, what? Because he know. But here in Germany, everybody thinks it's a music style, but it's not. So I guess Holland was pretty good to you. Did you move there at some point? No, never. Because I always think it's better you come somewhere and you come back. If you live there, you're maybe not so interesting anymore. And at what point, 
I mean, one of the things that changed too was that, you know, in the beginning, a lot of music was called house or a lot of music was called techno, like all styles of electronic music. And then at some point, the genres, like you were mentioning, it's hard to go on Beatport and find certain things that you want because also there's things split into so many different genres. What point did you see hardcore music start to become like all these different strands of hardcore? Because somehow we get like, there's like terror core, mm. it's a hard style. What else? The hard style is completely different. So there was a time like 2003, I say goodbye to hardcore. And um, then the hardcore goes really bad, and then there comes another style, which was hard style, which sounds a little bit like in the beginning of hardcore, and came also a style, and this get bored, then they come with a raw style. But in the beginning, in my time, there was like the rave hardcore, that's what we did, and there was like the terror, which became, if you ask today, Drox is really the famous terror DJ. It's the low spirit suck my cock, he say everything starts with that, when we did this, this track. But I did it on 220 BPM only for fun, but then it became a style, but I never was a hard uh, terror DJ. And there's certain styles also with the break beats, I don't know how they call that, break core, yeah, break core. But I'm not a friend of all these styles, for me it's all techno. Who was doing the terror? Dutch people? A lot, French, English, American, Australian, Northern Bluten. <laughs> oh, yeah, Nasenbluten from Australia. So you weren't making like 220 BPM? No. I did this one record, and that's all. For me, there must be always a groove. I like to make the people dance. You also can dance on 220, but maybe only it's three minutes. <laughs> only long enough to do the live show, as we saw. Uh, I want to play something else from another one of your aliases. Um, this one is from Pill Driver. What's up with Pill Driver? Yeah, also a track that Nina support in a moment. I did 95, I had an A side and I needed a B side. And I had not much time and I thought, okay, let's do a kick, filter it, put some delay on. And it was actually the first recording, so the whole track took seven minutes. Nobody cares about the A-side anymore <laughs> because it became a huge hit like Carl Cox played it, Laurent Garnier, these all really famous techno DJs. And it's only a kick drum. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. This is Pill Driver with Pitch Hiker. And there's no edits, no automation, nothing. It's one recording with one 909 kick and delay and preamps, EQs. So that was from 1997. Five. 95. Uh, was that on Cold Rush? What, what was the theme of this label, Cold Rush? Can I say that here? <laughs> so it's a Cold Rush Records. And uh, the, the little names was lost. So it's lost one, lost two, two, this is nine. And the idea was, this is probably the last record before you die on an overdose in the big hall on a rave. That's pretty dark, man. <laughs> I know. Um, what was your life like then at this time, around 95, 97? I mean, it's, it's interesting to me because, you know, you make this dark music and then you play these really hard raves and then it does be does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy that your life becomes like darker because you're doing all of that it's experience i mean um i was nearly dead two times on an overdose so but this is it's not like i sit the whole day there and be depressive this is not but music is all about so this was my life only in the studio but I stopped then with the drugs, so it was uh, 92 or 3, so really early. Yeah. But you didn't mind making music for people that were having these experiences? No, because and all that. back in the days you say E is the key. You know, it, it, it was a step 
for most of the people into that music, which I understand. Nowadays it's really dangerous because you don't know what's in there. When we start, there was no business around the drugs, so they were clean. Until the day they were not clean and this was the day where I nearly die. And then I make a deal with God and say if I survive this night, I stop. This was May Day 2 in Cologne. So, kind of early on into this? Yeah, four people die on this party. It was the first punch ecstasy in the history of techno. So, obviously that was a pretty dark experience, but you just thought, I need to not think too much about it. I need to just keep going yeah. with this and keep making like fun party tracks. Keep making like stuff that the, the yeah, ravers are going to want. I understand that. It's also like, I, I don't want to say like, oh, it was shit that I did that because now when I play, I know how the people feel. And as a DJ, you need to know how they feel. And they're on drugs, of course. And if you never took drugs or experienced anything, I don't think you can play for them. You know? But on the other side, you also can talk to them and, and tell them about your experience, that they not do the same mistakes. And today, the mistakes can be done really, really fast. You know? Yeah, I'm sure you've seen a lot of crazy things in your many yeah, years this party, of parties. One of these four I saw dying. I was on the bridge, and they took him out from the hall, and he was like white uh, soap comes out of his mouth, and his girlfriend was next to him crying, and I was like, fuck. And I had like from, from the feet to the back, like boom, what was in my head, and then my whole life, like you know from the movie, comes from the past, you know, like, hold your life really fast. And then in this moment, a friend touched me and he was driving us. I said, put me to the tree somewhere where to touch stones, bring me out of here. And then I actually had to play there, but I didn't do anymore. Nowadays, people are, especially club promoters, party promoters and DJs are also dealing with the same issues still. And also dealing with the issues of what people do in the club, how they act or you know, who's coming to the club, like, should we let these people in? And I know you said that you get asked quite a bit, especially in the German press, about hardcore because there's been a problem at some parties with neo-Nazis or white power people affiliating themselves with that genre. Um, have you ever had to take a stand on that as a DJ, uh, sorry, as a person playing in raves uh, one way or the other? Yeah, end of the 90s there became a problem that political companies try to filter their people into the hardcore party with also the bold hat and I didn't play on that particular promoter parties because I know that I was a I don't want that and then I don't know two three years later I was playing in Germany my MC is black so there was 10 people put up the hand up, the, I don't know, the Heil Hitler thing. So we leave the stage, there was 6,000 people, I didn't saw any security, so I thought better we not jump in. And then uh, it was May, and I sent an uh, email to all the promoters in Germany, and I canceled all my bookings until December, with the last sentence, we don't entertain neo-Nazis. And then I get like, I don't know, SMS, like, you fucking nigger friend, and stuff like that, and then they tried to uh, punch me three times in the club. But a lot of people that you knew were playing these parties knowing that this was going on. Exactly, and I was really pissed off with them because, yeah, they only think about the money, you know, and in that moment you should all together because there was never anything in the hardcore scene like that. You know, I mean, you have in every scene, you have some stupid people, but it was never like that. But now it's not anymore. It stops then. After this, there was a big discussion. And a lot of people came later to me and say, wow, it was great that you done that. And the beginning was not so like that. There was also not the big internet scene, you know, then they came out wrong stories. Because I say there was 10 people put the right hand up. And then later it was like Mark said that all West, uh, people from West Germany are Nazis, which I never said. We found out, I found the 10 people, and they lived 50 kilometers from Hamburg. 
in the north. <laughs> but not so far from you, I guess. Exactly. And you know, the scene is small and it took a couple of months, but we found it. Um, so, you know, in, in a long career, you have to make a lot of different decisions. And one of the decisions that you made is to um, let a very huge German group called Scooter use one of your tracks that was a big hit already uh, called I Like It Loud, a track that you made as Marshall Masters. Um, tell me, well, first of all, I want to hear the original of that song. What can you tell me about making this? Did you know already when you were making it that it was going to be a big hit? Right after, yes. We did this whole track in five hours, and I was sure it would become a hit. So, uh, what happened when Scooter came calling, asking to use that song? That's funny, because the story I just tell with May, where I cancel all my bookings, two, three weeks later, Jens Taylor is the manager of this group, I know him for a long time, he asked me, and then I thought, okay, it's like you split from your girlfriend and you take the key and throw her out, so if I do that, I cannot go back. But then I thought about three weeks, and then I say, okay, do it. Why did you ultimately decide to let them... Not only did they use the song, but you guys were actually in the video and connected to the song. It's not like they just paid you for an extended sample. It was a no, 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 not the sample. I have the, I have the whole publishing. Um, no, no, it was... Um, I, I, I say, okay, I want to be in the video. Yeah, because that I have also something out of it, you know. So, because otherwise everybody would think it's their track. And it was big in the Netherlands, 97, and in Belgium, 98, we hit golden record there. It's the most sold track ever in the hardcore. And yeah, and Scooter did it, yeah, 2003. So six years later, actually. Can we watch video number five? Oh God. Okay. So that's Scooter versus Mark Acardipane and Ultimate MC. It was their biggest hit. Maria, I like it loud. I still get publishing every year. I bet you do. This is off an album called The Stadium Techno Experience. Um, became the most played dance track on Viva and MTV and, uh, and actually a huge track at sporting events, as I guess it's no surprise to anyone. Like even the Philadelphia Flyers used to walk out to that song at one point. So it made it around the world. Um, how do Chesto you actually also cover it. Was it this year or last year? I think this year. You know DJ Chesto? Yeah. He did it also. So it's interesting to me that that video is stylized like kind of like a battle in that between was my idea. you and Scooter. Yeah, the guy, really funny, the guy who filmed it, when in the end of the video, HP, the MC from Scooter, and my MC stay next to that, and the camera guy say, I give you 500 when you hit him. <laughs> but you didn't. No, no, not me. Dick, uh, my MC, his name is Dick Rules, at that time. <laughs> but now it's another one. He's from New York, and he grew up in New York, uh, in Frankfurt. So how do you feel about this now? Do you think that that was, uh, like, are you happy with that decision? I mean, I can only assume that the royalties from that were good to you. Let's say if the other thing doesn't happen before, I had never done that. What do you mean? Yeah, if this uh, right-wing shit where I cancel my bookings doesn't happen, I would not do the tri uh, I didn't give them the allow, allow him to do the cover version. Never. It was like a bash in, in the face of the scene, you know, to see like, okay, I cannot come back. There's no way back. But you were kind of sick of the scene by that Not point. of the scene, it's, uh, you know, when nobody say anything and everybody only look like that, it just doesn't work, you know. I've come from Frankfurt and in Frankfurt we, 
grow up all together. We have from every country in the world, uh, nations, everybody live there peaceful together. And then I don't like that. And then as a DJ or as an artist, you have to stay, stand for the things, you know. And uh, most of the Dutch DJs, they are like from Indonesia, they're Jewish, they're from Africa, from whatever. And if they, uh, they also have to see that and then stop to play for these kind of promoters, you know. I don't say that these promoters were white ring, but they allow these people to get in. And that's the problem. You know, you have to be there before. If you see that, you have to stop that. And that's like, in, in Frankfurt, we never had this problem. So, did you take a break for a while at any point? It seems people like to write that they hadn't heard heard from you or heard any music from you, although I know you made some tracks like as res under the Resident E banner that are also considered some of the first or some important kind of hard style tracks. Um, I'm curious to know sort of what was going on in between, I don't know, 2004 and 2016 for you. Where you were, what you were feeling about the music, what you were listening to. Hmm. I think after the scooter thing, um, I got a new location with a really nice studio. And I was thinking about, when I, I remember that, I just told somebody here, when I was sitting there, when was the last time I really feel good when we do music? And it was with Sean from Trinidad. And at that moment he called me. I didn't hear from him for eight years, I think. And he was in London, he said, oh, let's do our album. We always had the plan to do an album electronically, really dark, but with vocals, he's a singer, and uh, with orchestra. And that I did for six years, but it never came out. I met him in 96 when I was working in a studio in Trinidad. There's a really big studio where Puff Daddy recorded the B.I.G. album. He was the week there before we were there, but uh, nobody knows Puff Daddy in Germany at that time. I heard it later and Sean worked with them. And then Sean was actually an engineer there. And then one night I was sitting there and he said, oh, can I sing over the track? I said, you are a singer? He said, yeah, yeah. And then he go down and then I took him to Germany. And we did, I like it loud, he's the original voice. But then he left again because of his girlfriend. And then he came back 2004. So, so you made this record, but you didn't put out because you no. didn't like it. Yeah, it was a really strange story. We did in the beginning, so we did the whole album. I liked it, it was cool. But it was not sounding like I wanted to. The feeling was right, but the mix was not sounding cool. And maybe five years later, I know how to mix it good. This was where all the Americans came in and helped us with the mixing. But then the whole vibe was gone. There was no emotion anymore in the tracks. And then we go on and, and put the first versions we had and work on them. But, but in the end, it was pain in the ass, and then we stopped it. Did, had you moved on to um, producing digitally at this point, or some mix of mixed digital up. and analog? Mixed up, yeah. Because I know you were saying... But mixing was more digital. You, you were right, yeah. That's a problem. I should never sold my board at that time. Yeah, because you were. It was also like trying to do new things, right? Learn new things, do things in a different way than you had done a lot of your big hits. No. Um, what can you tell us about um, working with digital, coming from an analog background? Like anything that you learned that you need to do digitally that you didn't have to concern yourself with when you were just using like a Moog and a 909? It's also from EQing, I don't know, with analog, you boost 15 dB without problem. And digitally, you can do it also, but you would not do it because you see it, you know, or with the graphic EQs, okay, now you can also use without graphic EQs. But that's the point, the compression sound weird. Nowadays, there's some okay plugins and you cannot touch anything. I don't know, I think it was the sound. With the analog, it was much easier, because what I say in the beginning is the harmonic distortion. Everything fits together better, everything glued to itself. You destroy the master bus, it's kind of little compression there all the time, if you use the right board. You don't have this in the digital. You can do it in digitally, but it's also like a lot of American mixers say, oh yeah, I mix everything in the box now, okay, but what they get is recorded analog. So. 
you know, if they get the singer recorded to a nice Neve preamp and uh, compressed with 1176, after you can go with a digital EQ on it, but if you don't have that, you will have a hard time to get it right on the, in the DAW. So I want to hear something from this new record, which is called Undetected Act from the Gloom Chamber. I think you had a track that you wanted to hear from it. Shadow Deception. What, why is it? Why this one? Um, I get this Moog synthesizer, and this was actually the first sound I did it, and I know this will be the hit record on the album, and I was right. So all the major DJs play it now, but I think you have to go a little bit in the middle of the track when the break comes, just before it's only groove. All right, I'm going to do my best. And I played it the first time in Lyon, and like everybody was dancing, I said, yeah, right. And it was really funny, you know, like a big company like Dior uh, asked an English company to do this advertisement. So, and they asked a guy from Rome which tracks are cool, and one of them was mine. So they choose the one, then they go, it's unbelievable. They go on SoundCloud, found my track, upload it from another guy, and pay him. And release it with Dave Gam, one minute video, you know, with the whole track play one minute. <laughs> yeah, the business side of this is super crazy. Maybe we can... I mean, there's Discogs. You can find out uh, who owns which track. I mean, you cannot ask somebody and pay him money. I mean, this is completely childish. <laughs> 